thank you everybody for coming back to the online seminar series uh, machine learning needs uh, mathematical optimization so today we are very pleased to have through uh, missionary um, from uh, imperial college so uh, ruth um, did her phd studies in uh, princeton university and then uh, he she returned to uh, imperial college and um, was first uh, Royal Academy of Engineering Fellow, and she has uh, done all the usual steps uh, after uh, achieving her professorship position uh, last year. She works on uh, global optimization uh, and uh, optimization under uncertainty, and among the applications she works on are uh, petrochemical um, and bioprocesses. Uh, we can um, name uh, lots of uh, prizes that Ruth uh, has received, but I just have uh, the latest one, which is uh, the 2020 Cast Outstanding Young uh, Researcher Award. And I can also add that uh, Ruth uh, will be this year a keynote speaker at the Euro Conference in Athens. So we are uh, very pleased to um, hear what uh, Ruth will tell us about partitioning-based formulation for uh, mixed integer optimization in um, uh, neural networks. Thank you so much uh, for joining today, and the floor is yours. Hi. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, really, the, the organizers are doing a, a beautiful job of sort of doing as much interaction as we can at this time, and it's making me really sad because in the participant list, I see a lot of people I already know, and I wish I could see you in person and look forward to seeing you very soon. Um, so what I'm presenting today is work that is done uh, primarily by uh, Calvin Say and Jan Kronquist. Uh, Jan led one of the two papers that's going to appear in CPAIOR, and Calvin led a paper that is now uh, posted to archive. Uh, so here is the team, and we're all at Imperial, except for Jan, who is recently moving to uh, KPH as a new assistant professor. So what I'm going to be talking about today is optimization over trained neural networks. And so what I'm going to assume that we have already is we have a trained neural net already. So there's, there's a neural net and it has been trained. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to do some sort of optimization over the neural net uh, to do some kind of investigation of it. So for instance, I might have an image. Uh, that's this image here, uh, the nine. It has a correct label, um, j is equal to nine, and I might want to find an adversary, say a k is equal to four. If I perturb um, using, say, the L1 norm, and I go a distance of four away, well then already maybe this particular trained neural net is going to predict now that this shape that's been changed a bit is a four and not a nine. If I was going to perturb using the L infinity norm, um, in this particular case, I would need a perturbation of 0 0.05. Um, and again, this image on the right-hand side is going to be mistaken by the, this particular neural net as a 4. Um, so this is the famous verification problem, or uh, it's not quite the verification problem. What the verification problem is, is basically, can you find an adversary labeled 4, basically something that the neural net predicts is a 4, within a given perturbation? That's, of course, a feasibility problem. Um, is there a, a, a perturbation? And then um, there are also uh, optimal adversary problems, minimal distorted adversary problems. Uh, these are assorted other questions. Um, and then Tiago and uh, some of his team have thought about lossless compression. Basically, how can I safely remove neural network nodes or layers? So over and over again, basically what this is, is its optimization over an already trained neural net. Okay. Now, so I'm already going to say that we have this particular big M formulation of the learned uh, ReLU neural net. And I should mention that for some amount of time, there's been a big M formulation of this ReLU neural net. Um, and basically what happens is that uh, for each particular node in the network, so I'll, I'm gonna zero in on one node, you end up with um, all of these variables x, these are your inputs, um, and they mix together with your, um, your weights w, 
and you end up for the output of the node, you get this soft max function. So what happens is you multiply um, these parameters w times the variables x, and then you add a parameter b. You might notice that this is a different set of variables and parameters than you would have seen if you were training the neural net. If you were training the neural net, you would be choosing the variables w and b. I'm assuming that those are now fixed and that the neural network architecture is fixed. And I'm assuming rather that you can choose the input. This would be something like choosing the adversary and that you can choose uh, the output of each node rather that these are the variables in the optimization bubble. Anyway, um, this is a paper of Matteo Fischetti. And what Matteo did uh, is he uh, took a look at this big M formulation. And of course, because it's a big M formulation, you have to think carefully about choosing these big M coefficients, uh, as we see often in mixed integer programming. Okay. Um, and the, the, uh, the binary variable that is turning on and off these, um, this node is this uh, sigma. So sigma is saying whether or not uh, that node is active, basically whether we're, we're having uh, the zero or the uh, W transpose X plus B. Okay, so I want to improve on big M. Um, and the reason that I want to do so is first off, there are a lot of state of the art verification tools that rely on big M. Um, I'm particularly mentioning verification here because that's the biggest community uh, that's sort of, there's quite a number of them uh, looking at this sort of thing. But beyond just verification, there is a number of other applications uh, that uh, use Big M. I'm mentioning quite a number of them here. And in particular, what I want to be thinking about is developing alternatives to dynamic cut generation. Um, so there's a really nice paper of Anderson et al. Uh, that recently appeared in operations research um, that's going to develop exponentially many cuts from a node's convex hull. So of course they can either develop exponentially many cuts or they can have a uh, mixed integer formulation that's in a lifted space compared uh, to the original uh, number of variables. Uh, they find that the um, optimization problem in the lifted space is fairly difficult to solve. Um, so they develop a method that works with exponentially many cuts. Um, the problem that people have had in recent years is that this method doesn't always scale well to large neural nets. Um, and in particular, some of our recent work found that callback frequencies uh, that are really not very often at all balance computational burden and model tightening. And so we want to be um, developing something that's different than Big M because Big M is basically state of the art uh, in verification at this particular time. Okay. So let's go uh, back to uh, the sort of single node in this uh, neural network. Again, the inputs um, X and the outputs Y to, my, to each node in the neural net are my variables, and my Ws and my Bs are uh, parameters. So OK, um, we have already a big M formulation for uh, this particular problem. Um, but why don't we go back to the sort of seminal work of Bolish? I'm using a very recent reference, but of course, this work much predates um, uh, the disjunctive programming work much predates 2018. Um, and we'll think about now um, this, this disjunction and how we can manage it. So either it's going to be true that y is equal to zero, or it's going to be true that y is equal to this affine function right here. So you're either, your node is either off or it's on. Um, if my node is on, then it must be true that w transpose x plus b is greater than or equal to zero. And if my node is off, then it must be true that w transpose x plus b is less than or equal to zero. Um, clearly, I don't need uh, both of these, uh, the two bottom equations and the disjunction, but I'm going to keep them uh, just for strengthening purposes. OK, so here's a formulation that is equivalent to the big M formulation, except that it adds uh, one additional variable and four additional constraints. And the only thing that is happening here is that we are um, taking um, basically a disjunctive programming relaxation right here, um, and we are reformulating according to Bolish. Um, you'll notice that I, in my formulation, I have two extra variables. There's the ZA and the ZB, uh, but we have this equality sign here. And so um, 
I can get rid of one of my ZAs or ZBs. Uh, in our case, we always happen to get rid of the ZAs, and so we only end up with this one extra variable, uh, ZB. Good. Okay, well, this is another possible formulation um, uh, to big M, uh, slightly bigger than big M, but that's okay. Um, but now maybe we ought to think about our, um, a, a different way of, of managing things. And what I'm going to do is I'm now going to think about uh, partitioning the inputs to the node into two categories. So there's going to be um, these inputs to the node uh, from x1 all the way up to xk. And then there are going to be the inputs to the node from xk plus 1 all the way up to x eta. Um, and I'm going to rewrite the disjunction. And the way that I'm going to rewrite the disjunction is, again, we have either that the uh, node is deactivated and y is equal to 0, or that we have that the node is activated and y is equal to the w transpose uh, x plus b. But instead of writing w transpose x, I will instead write z1 plus z2. And what it's going to be is that um, the w transpose x in the first partition, basically the part of the dot product that goes from i is equal to 1 all the way up to k, so I'm showing it here as this, this partition, is going to be uh, equal to um, my, my z1. And my uh, Z2 is going to be uh, XK plus 1 all the way up to X eta. Um, again, I'm going to use this uh, Z1A and this Z1B, um, but I can knock one of the two of them out. Um, so I can do that by reformulating. Um, but in, in total, um, the Z1s are going to correspond to the first partition. The Z2s correspond to the second partition. Okay, here is a formulation that now includes uh, two extra variables, uh, or it could include two extra variables. The way I'm writing it, it includes four extra variables, but remember I can get rid of one of either Z1A or Z1B, and one of either Z2A or Z2B. Um, but basically what's going on here is that um, we have a possibility here of maybe uh, tighter bounds on these Zs than we could have had on the W transpose Xs, right? Because what we end up with is we end up with um, uh, ZNA um, is going on or off with now these uh, different big M coefficients. Um, and so what's happening is that um, It's these different big M coefficients. Um, and so what's happening is that if we can get tighter bounds on these parameters LB, uh, NA, UB, NA, or LB, NB, or UB, NB, then we're golden in terms of perhaps being having, having an advantage in solving time. Okay, so this is really nice. Um, I have in this written out formulation, I have four extra variables. I could reduce it to two. And I have a total of um, four extra uh, constraints. Actually, it'll be eight extra constraints. OK, well, I could keep doing this, right? Um, I already divided into uh, two partitions that are coming into the node. I could have divided into three partitions into the coming into the node, four partitions coming into the node. After a while, it would be a bit silly to talk about this. Um, but basically, I keep saying over and over again that what I could do is I could take this entire um, W transpose X transpose, and instead of writing it as uh, one term, I could disaggregate it and disaggregate it um, until I was maybe even going up to number of partitions equals A. Okay. So here's our proposed formulation. Um, from the previous slide, the differences are going to be um, that I that we knocked out one of the two extra auxiliary variables. Um, but um, okay, you can check that it's correct. Um, but let's talk about the differences first uh, from the Big M formulation. First off, um, the differences from the Big M formulation, we've added more things to decide uh, when developing this formulation. Um, so first off, there's this partition parameter, uh, Big N. 
this partition parameter is how many sort of buckets we have uh, to, to divide that term uh, W transpose X into. Then after how many, deciding how many buckets, we do have to decide how to aggregate each of the, um, each of the weights into a bucket. Um, so for instance, in the previous slide, I just said, okay, so one to maybe, I don't know, K minus one is in bucket one, K is in bucket two, K plus one all the way up to A uh, is in bucket three, but I could have done this in many, many different ways, of course. Um, and we have N new auxiliary variables uh, and four N new constraints. Uh, I presented it as uh, 2N auxiliary variables, but then there are all those equality signs, and so we can knock them out. So really, here in green um, at the top, I'm really giving a number of disadvantages with respect to big M. Um, I'm adding uh, parameters, right? I'm adding sort of, you have to choose what your, what your partition parameter is, and you have to choose what are the subsets uh, into which you divide this. But there are some things that I'm really, really excited about with this formulation. So first off, as we already mentioned, uh, N is equal to one is equivalent to big M. You probably wouldn't wanna use this formulation because it does still introduce a new auxiliary variable and four new constraints, um, but, but you do have something that's equivalent. If I was to choose N is equal to eta, then I would have something that was equivalent to the convex hull. Um, this is a lifted formulation. You'll notice that I have these N new auxiliary variables, uh, so it's lifted to a higher dimensional space. I could have alternatively decided to develop a non-lifted formulation that would have two to the N constraints. Um, so remember that a convex hull formulation uh, will have two to the eta constraints, um, so I could make that fewer if I wish. What I think is kind of fun about this, uh, in addition, is that I can have a hierarchy of relaxations uh, with, with respect to increasing size and tightness if I do things in a careful sort of way, right? If um, basically I had um, all of my eta in one bucket and then I divided that one bucket, um, then I would have a formulation that was at least as tight. If I then strictly divided one of those two buckets uh, into two, I would have a formulation that was at least as tight, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's kind of no fair going from formulation to formulation, swapping what goes in what bucket. Um, but if we kind of just divide buckets as we go along, uh, increasing up the hierarchy level, we do indeed get a hierarchy, which is cool. Um, and you might notice that what becomes key are these um, LBs and UBs. So these LBs and UBs, they are the same as any big M parameter uh, that we have all encountered before. Um, and so we might want to think about interval arithmetic uh, for them or optimization-based bounce tightening. Great. Um, okay, so good. We have um, a relaxation. And what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to show uh, an example that was trained on a, a very uh, simple problem. Um, so this is trained on the uh, well-known Ackley function. It has two inputs. Um, and in this uh, particular example, uh, we only have uh, the, the layer of inputs, the, the, the output, and then basically uh, 20, or one, one hidden layer and uh, 20 um, nodes in that layer. So what we have here is n is equal to 20 is equal to the complex hull. Um, so this is quite a small example. Um, we're not going to use examples this small to try and motivate that we think uh, this is an exciting new set of formulations to use. Um, but the point here that we're trying to show is that if you're to use n is equal to 1, um, you get these sort of loose bounds. And this is what people will often get when they solve sort of verification problems and the like. Um, where basically this blue is this function um, is the sort of uh, uh, is the response surface of the neural net uh, to different inputs x1 and x2. Um, the orange is the lower bound that you get if you develop a big M relaxation. The green is the upper bound if you develop a big M relaxation. If you develop a convex hull relaxation, that's equal to n is equal to 20, and you end up with something that is much tighter. As we all know, a convex hull tends to be a tighter formulation than big M. Um, but what I want to call your attention to is that in between, if I have a value between n is equal to 1 and n is equal to 20, I'm just trying to appeal to your eye to say that 
as we increase n, we seem to increase the tightness of the formulation. Okay, so that's one observation. Um, the other observation is we mentioned that there were all of these parameters um, that are effectively big M parameters. Um, we can tighten them using interval arithmetic. If we tighten them using interval arithmetic, we get uh, the picture on the top. If we tighten them using optimization, optimization-based bounds tightening, we get the picture on the bottom. Um, and just to note that, I mean, optimization-based bounds tightening has always been important to me because I really like uh, MINLP. Um, but additionally, in the specific uh, um, verification literature, it is well known that optimization-based bounds tightening helps. Um, so basically, it's known for n is equal to 1, going from uh, interval arithmetic to optimization-based bounds tightening is good. Um, and we're saying that we get the exact same advantages out of our formulations. Great. Okay. Um, another thing to mention is that we have introduced this new parameter, right? So um, kind of no fair just sort of changing what my parameter value is and then telling you that I always get something uh, better than big M, right? Because that would be the equivalent of possibly trying a lot of N values. Um, so let's let's about that n uh, parameter in detail. Um, what this is is it's um, taking a number of solved uh, versus runtime, and we're looking at optimal adversary. Um, this is the same as in the Anderson et al. paper, um, and we're trying an optimal adversary on a convolutional neural net uh, with two layers um, and a hundred uh, hidden nodes per layer. Um, and then I should note that each line is 100 different examples. So basically, we take a number of different examples from CIFAR, and then we find or 100 of them, and we find an optimal adversary for every single one. Um, so what's common here is that the neural net is staying the same between each one of the runs. OK, so over time, what you can see is that um, big M is the one in pink. It's always uh, the uh, the lowest. You don't want to be low on this plot because low is you haven't solved a whole lot of problems. So big M is performing the worst. Um, it is not solving a whole lot of problems. Um, the next thing I might call your attention to is the orange line. Um, it's quite bold. This is the one that's n is equal to 2. You'll see that kind of at the beginning, um, it's solving maybe more problems than some of the others, but that over time, it's solving fewer. Um, what's going on if you sort of dig into the data, um, which you can't with this plot, but I know from looking at it, is that uh, n is equal to 2 is solving the easy problems uh, very, very quickly, and then the more difficult problems it's not able to, to get. Uh, the next thing that you might notice is that sort of some of these intermediate values of n, sort of like n is equal to 3 or 4 or 2, um, is going to be uh, really quite good for the problem. And then you get performance declining as n gets large, uh, like 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, this last um, point is quite similar to the point that we would make when we would say, well, convex hull is tighter than big M, but we would prefer to use big M um, because we don't have a very, very good performance. This is basically the exact same thing. The other thing we have to choose, of course, is what bins to put everything in. So let's say I've decided to put, uh, to use uh, two bins, and I only have uh, four inputs uh, to this particular node. Of course, uh, you know, even a small um, uh, neural net is typically going to have uh, 100 inputs. Um, but let's um, let's do a thought experiment here. Um, so we have four inputs into this node, and they have these weights. Let's say they have weights 1, 1, 100, 100. Um, so one option that I might have is that, remember, I'm going to divide um, this, uh, basically, this multiplication W transpose X uh, into uh, two parts. And then I end up sort of turning on or off uh, those, those individual parts. One option that I have would be um, this x. Um, I could put the x1 into one bin all by itself, and then I could put um, the other three inputs uh, all into a separate bin. I would argue 
that um, this formulation on the left, um, this sort of choice of the binning would be really good uh, or a really good approximation for that first input. So if I somehow knew that that first input was really important, then maybe this would be a really great formulation because it would very well approximate the conduct's hull um, for uh, that particular input, um, but it wouldn't be so good for those other inputs. Another option I might have is I could divide equally um, the inputs into bins. So I could put two inputs into one bin and two inputs into another bin. Um, now, what I'm doing here in this, in this center bit is that what if I put X1 and X3 into uh, one bin and X2 and X4 into another bin? Now, this would seem to be a pretty good um, this top line would be a, seem to be a pretty good estimate of X3. And this bottom line would seem to be a pretty good estimate of X4. Um, but in both cases, um, this would seem to be a very bad estimate of X1 and X2, right? Because X1 and X2 are orders of magnitude different, uh, or rather their weights are order of, orders of magnitude different than the weights that are on X3 and X4. Um, and so somehow, um, the the result would be something that was close to the convex hull for X3 and X4, um, but not so much for X1 and X2. A final option that we might think about um, would be something like um, we try to not only keep the uh, the sort of the number in each bin equal, but we also try to keep the orders of magnitude of the weights equal to one another, um, and this would then make it that uh, maybe X1 and X2, uh, neither one of them would sort of, we neither one of them would maybe exactly uh, represent the convex hull of either X1 or X2, um, but somehow this might be uh, a nice um, way of, of relaxing the problem. Okay, so I've talked through these different uh, variants, and the truth is that ultimately I don't have a way of saying absolutely sort of hand on my heart, I know how to um, bin these particular weights or these particular inputs. Uh, but we have a number of proposals. The first proposal that we have is that we might want uh, equal size partitions. So this would be something like, well, if I'm going to have uh, two partitions, then I want in that top example, I want two inputs in one partition and two inputs in another. So I want the size all to be equal as much as possible. And then I want the weights in each partition to be as similar as possible. Um, basically, my proposal is that we do not want uh, this um, situation in the center where we end up with very different orders of magnitudes of the weights coming into the node. We rather want this uh, situation on the right hand side. Um, another option would be something like equal range, where basically we take the uh, the very highest weights and the very lowest weights, basically the ones that are complete outliers, we put them in, in their own bin. And then for everything in the middle, um, we put in bins things to get an equal range. Um, and so what this second strategy would be is to say basically, well, we'd kind of like um, this situation where all of the coefficients are roughly equal to one another. Now, I don't have a way of proving this, and so what I'm going to show rather than doing any proof is just a lot of experiments, um, and I'm going to compare uh, these two partitioning strategies that we have to a weak partitioning, which would be dissimilar weights. And so one would be sort of a random assignment where you just sort of let things fall where they may, and an, and an, um, an alternative that we posit would be even weaker would be uneven magnitudes. And so basically what we have is we're trying to make a situation like this thing in the middle um, where you end up with as different weights as possible. Okay, um, that's the experimental conditions. Happy to talk about them more. Um, but basically let's uh, look at, at the results to begin with. Um, on the left-hand side, we have the number solved. Um, the ones that are dotted up at the top, um, these are with optimality-based bounds tightening, where basically we give all the, the different strategies uh, sort of equal opportunity to do optimization-based bounds tightening, and then that, when that's done, we solve the problems. Um, and so, of course, if you're going to use optimization-based bounds tightening, you get better, uh, you get more problems solved, and you solve them faster uh, once you start solving them. Um, so this this top block is optimization-based bounds tightening. The bottom block is interval arithmetic. Um, 
And then within optimization-based bounce tightening, you'll notice that our sort of equal size and equal range um, uh, strategies are outperforming the random and uneven strategies. Um, similarly, um, without optimization-based bounce tightening with only interval arithmetic, the equal size and equal range are again outperforming random and uneven. Okay, so that's great. In particular, this uneven strategy where we're making the coefficients as different as possible from one another seems to be performing the worst in, with respect to numbers solved. It's great. Um, so you want to be as high as possible on this left graph because you want to solve as many as possible. On the right-hand graph, you want to be as low as possible because you want to solve quickly, right? Um, and so basically, as expected, optimization-based bounds typing goes faster uh, than interval arithmetic, not a surprise. Um, but here what we have is that um, for optimization-based bounds typing in particular, uh, the difference is obvious. Um, we end up with our partitioning strategies performing much better um, than the random strategies. Now, a couple more things to mention about this. this these are actually graphs with respect to N. And so what you'll notice is that with respect to something like um, average time solved, um, actually, if you use a bad partitioning strategy, you'll see that as n grows bigger, you're very quickly worse than um, uh, basically the equivalent of big M, which is n is equal to 1. However, for our equal size and equal range strategy, you can get an improvement for small n. Um, similarly, on uh, the, the left-hand side, um, in particular, uh, you can sort of solve more problems uh, in both this top blue line and the bottom blue line um, than n is equal to 1 with our particular partitioning strategies. If you choose bad partitioning strategies, then you're going to be worse than big M. Um, again, this is a, a convolutional neural net with n layers. Uh, uh, sorry, two layers and 100 uh, hidden nodes per layer. Um, and we're giving um, an, an hour solve time. And this is 100 runs. 100 runs means that you pick uh, 100 different examples from MNIST, and then you find optimal adversaries for them. OK, cool. So um, the bad. Uh, news is that if you want to use our work, you've got to choose uh, two basically new parameters. One is this value of n, and one is how to partition uh, the, the inputs. Um, but we argue from these last two slides that actually choosing these parameters tends to be fairly robust, and we know how to do it. Um, so basically, we can tend to outperform uh, other formulations. So that's great, is that um, if we have fairly constant uh, parameter choices, then we're fine. OK, um, so what this is now is just a, a very big table. Um, this is a whole bunch of optimal adversary problems. What you're doing here is you're kind of given a, a perturbation a priori. Uh, that's this column right here. And we're choosing um, that epsilon such that big M can solve some of the problems. Basically, as this epsilon uh, gets bigger, everybody can solve these problems. As epsilon gets smaller, uh, these things get more and more difficult uh, for big M. And so we're tuning that epsilon uh, so that big M can solve some. That way, uh, we have a good comparison point. Because we'd, one, like to be able to solve more problems than big M. And two, we'd like to be able to solve for problems that big M can already solve. We'd like to be able to solve them faster. Um, each one of these uh, rows is 100 runs, so 100 examples where we would find optimal adversaries. And then uh, the model is the size uh, of the problem that we're looking at. OK, so what's great is that um, for uh, basically every single one of um, the, the problems where we have two partitions, we are solving at least as many if uh, Big M is solving all of them uh, with our two partitions, possibly solving more, um, very often solving more problems. With four partitions, we are also typically solving more. Um, we are also significantly faster. 
um, I should notice, I should note that all of these are solved with our equal uh, size strategy. So we're not, there's no funny business here with respect to sort of changing where the inputs are. Uh, and and uh, uh, this is, so this is basically one parameter choice is two partitions and one parameter choice is four partitions. And you can see whether I choose two or four, we're um, almost always going to be outperforming Big M. That's optimal adversary. Um, another uh, sort of optimization problem, this is actually a feasibility problem that's important in this space, is verification. With verification, you just want to know uh, within a perturbation that you're going to allow, is there an adversary? Again, we chose this perturbation so that Big M could solve some of the problems. And again, we're outperforming uh, Big M, both res with respect to the number of problems solved and also with respect to the amount of time um, that each problem takes to solve. Okay, the last of my uh, three examples is in this minimally distorted adversarial example, where basically what you do is you find what's the smallest perturbation before um, you're going to have an adversary, where you're, you know, what's the smallest perturbation before I'm going to predict using that particular neural net of four when I wanted it to be a nine. Um, again, um, the two and four partitions with the equal size strategy are solving more problems and doing it significantly faster. All right, so so this is great. Um, I really like optimization over neural nets, and this is this is definitely important. Um, but it would it would feel impoverished if this was sort of the only uh, application that that I could manage. And so um, let's talk about sort of uh, generalizations uh, to different classes of problems. So what we're going to be thinking about is we're going to be thinking about MINLP with disjunctions. Um, so we've 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 got these uh, uh, disjunct indices uh, D, um, and we're going to say basically uh, one of one of these has to be true. Okay. Um, I'm going to assume a number of things. Um, the first thing that I'm going to assume is that the G's are convex additively separable. That is that basically I can uh, write the G's as a sum of H's where each one of the H's is convex and each um, uh, basically each one of the H's is just sort of maybe a monomial. Um, I don't strictly need this first assumption. This would work also for something that was uh, partially uh, additively separable. Um, but anyway, um, for now it makes my proofs easier and there's already a lot of examples that have this particular structure. I want my functions to be bounded. Um, and then the last assumption that I'm making is that there are far fewer constraints than number of variables in each of the disjunctions. I don't need this one at all uh, for the proofs. It is rather that we need this for um, the for the practical case that we think that this particular line of thought is reasonable. Good. Okay. Um, we think that there are a lot of applications that are relevant. Um, we already mentioned uh, ReLU neural nets uh, sort of uh, quite a while just now, um, but we also think there are a number of other applications, both in machine learning um, and also um, Jan Kronquist, who led this particular uh, thread of research, had also come up with some other optimization problems that we think are relevant. Good. So what's the idea? Um, remember that we had these disjuncts uh, G that we assumed were these convex additively separable functions H. So basically each one of these H's is convex and it's a function of exactly uh, one variable uh, X. Um, and then we have these E's that are parameters in my optimization problem. Um, and now what we're going to do, um, and this is uh, work of John Conquist again, is that we're going to lift to a higher dimensional space, right? So the first thing that we're going to do is we're, we're going to lift with uh, the number of partitions times uh, the, the number of disjunctions, uh, new variables. Um, remember that uh, in our, um, our ReLU neural net, um, we, uh, had d is equal to one, and so we just had n new variables, um, but this is a slightly more general case. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to relax the splitted constraints to global constraints. And so what we mean by that is that, um, oh, sorry, I'm 
I'm pressing the arrow key and it's not working. Okay, there we go. Um, so I should say we, we lifted with n times d new variables. These new variables are these alphas, right? So alpha 1 all the way up to alpha n. Um, and I'll need as many of them um, as I have indices d. Um, and each of these alphas is now going to be the thing that bounds uh, the, the h's. And then the sum of the alphas is going to give me my, my b's. So in blue is what was there already in the optimization problem. And these alphas are the new, uh, the new sort of kids in town. Um, and so basically what we've done is we've added uh, these new variables. And now in this second step, we're relaxing uh, the splitted constraints to the global constraints, which is to say that we are pulling uh, these splitted constraints out of the, the disjunction and, and placing them here. What we can prove um, is that the feasible x space doesn't change, so that the, the space of the x variables uh, stays the exact same. It's just that we're in a higher dimensional space. OK, so now um, we have an n split um, representation. So what's going on here is that in this n split representation, we have, of course, n times d new variables. Um, and um, we have pulled out uh, constraints from the disjunction. OK, now what we need to do is that we take that n split disjunction on the previous page and we apply um, the extended formulation of Bolish. So now we take the convex hull, not uh, a convex hull in sort of the, the, the basic step methodology of, methodology of Bolish, but rather the convex hull in the sense that we're taking the convex hull of the n-split disjunction, right? We're taking the convex hull of, of, of this thing right here. Um, and we get uh, what, what is written on this slide. And Jan was able to prove quite a number of things uh, related to this, all of which I'm delighted about. Um, the first thing he was able to prove is that the feasible x space stays the same. He was able to prove that if you have a one split, that is, if n is equal to one, um, you have a relaxation that is equivalent to the big M. If every one of the functions that you're relaxing are affine, then an eta split, that is something where you take uh, every single one of the H's and you put it in its own separate bin, then the eta split is equivalent to uh, the, the convex hull um, from, from Bolish. And if H is affine, remember that this is the ReLU neural net case, um, you can get uh, a hierarchy of relaxations that go between uh, big M and convex hull. Again, you have to be fairly careful here because basically what you have to do is you have to end up sort of splitting the partitions and splitting them again and splitting them again to be able to get this hierarchy. Um, but you can get a hierarchy if you wish. Um, so all of these, um, or the proofs are easiest when we think about affine functions, but remember that not all functions that we are interested in might be affine. Um, so Jan developed this example that is on uh, n splits with these nonlinear functions. Um, so the, the feasible space of this particular uh, problem that's right here, or this particular set of constraints, are the two black dots. The one split or the, the big M uh, formulation will give you a relaxation uh, that goes with this gray circle. And remember that this particular relaxation we're looking at is projected onto just two variables when really there are four variables that we're considering. Um, we could think about a two split relaxation that would divide um, us into sort of x1, x2, and then also x3, x4. Um, you can see visually that the two split relaxation tightens things. The four split relaxation, remember for ReLU neural nets and for anything that uh, the functions are affine, this is going to be equivalent to the convex hull. You can see that the four split relaxation is not equivalent to this convex hull because you have these sneaky bits on the side here and the sneaky bits on the side here um, that are clearly sort of outside the convex hull. However, the four split relaxation is still tighter than the two split, uh, tighter than big M. So that's nice. Um, for want of time, I will not present the experimental results, but just to note that we have experimental results that seem to indicate this works. Happy to talk about those more. Um, 
but I just want to close by mentioning uh, sort of what we have here. What we have is that we have relaxations that are sort of intermediate to big M and convex hull. Um, and in particular, uh, if we have affine functions and we have uh, specific assumptions that we're making, we can get a hierarchy. Um, we do this by introducing basically two uh, new choices. One is this parameter n, that's the number of splits. Then there's the aggregation choice of how to group things. However, for the, the examples that we've tested, and I've presented in detail uh, the ReLU neural nets, uh, but then we've also looked at a number of other examples, the parameter choices do seem to be robust across many uh, instances. Particularly for ReLU, we were able to solve 25% more problems in an hour and get an average speed up uh, from problems that could already be solved of uh, more than two. And there are promising computational results for other classes of problems. So I, I promised that I would finish in 45 minutes, and I have. Um, so I hope that I'll get a lot of questions. Thank you so much, uh, Ruth, for such a wonderful presentation. Um, so we now can open the floor for questions. So I suggest that if you have a question, please unmute. And um, if you can, also show your video. So I guess it was all uh, very clear. <laughs> it was all very clear. Um, I could just mention this slide then that I skipped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So basically, what's happening here um, is these are some instances. These are these are clustering problems uh, with with two different formulations at the top and at the bottom. Um, and then these are some problems that Jan Kronquist developed uh, as part of his postdoc. Um, and basically what's happening here is that we are choosing um, these splits. And you'll notice that we have 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Um, and then here at the bottom, we have 14, 28, 56, 196, 392. And so one possible um, sort of anxiety that, that you might have with something like this is, oh boy, these people really just always need to be um, sort of tuning their 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 big n um, that is sort of choosing the number of splits to get things that are better than the big m or convex hull um, but really what's going on here is that um, the two split and this 14 split you end up because um, uh, the problems are very different sizes there's the same number roughly of variables in every single one of uh, these problems and the same number of variables in four split versus 28 split for this particular problem. Um, and so um, these results are actually fairly robust across uh, parameters with respect to number of variables in each one of the splits. And what's happening here again um, is that basically we are um, now solving problems that couldn't be solved before and doing that uh, significantly faster. So may I ask, uh, so for the uh, top clustering uh, rows and for the bottom clustering rows, what you are saying is that the clustering method is different? I can't remember. It's, um, they're different, they're different optimization formulations. Yeah. Um, they're basically, it's, it's this clustering formulation versus this clustering formulation. Um, mm -hmm. So that second one, I think, is the cluster M, and this is the cluster G, if I remember correctly. Yeah, thank you. Um, so again, I, if the audience has uh, questions, yeah, feel free. Yeah, yeah. So I see that. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask about these clustering problems. Are they uh, any specific clustering problems, like K-means or K-center problems? Is it possible? Let me refresh myself on that. Um, Uh, 
so the one that is M, oh, right, right. So the G one is K means clustering. Yeah, I had, um, I had forgotten. This was nice okay. computational work that was done by Jan. And so basically what's going on is that um, this clustering formulation right here is a K means clustering. And then I can't remember what is the difference with this one. Um, all right, I, I can find it on the papers, I guess. Yeah, no, 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 it, it's basically, I think the, the overall point that we're trying to make is that um, this, is, this is a formulation that's fairly robust to all the different problems that we're trying, right? Yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, thank you. Is there any other question from the audience? Uh, yes, I have a question. Thank you very much for the presentation. I liked it very much. And uh, I'm, I'm interested in, in a, a how to split and how to cluster the inputs. Would you do this uh, with uh, an, another model, for example? Uh, would you learn it from data or would you do data driven as well? Instead of. Yeah, uh, so, I, I mean, this is, I think there are, you know, of course, I, I really like this point, right? Because I don't claim that we have the very best partitioning strategies, right? Is that we have something that sort of somehow seems to make sense to us, is that somehow we wanted to sort of spread out the benefits uh, from our formulation to as many inputs as possible. Um, but I think the, the point that you're making that's, that's quite valid is that, you know, maybe it's that this uh, first input really is more important than X2, X3, X4, right? Um, and if that's so, well, then this formulation on the left would be great because it would be really nice to really nicely approximate uh, X1. And then, um, you know, who cares about the other ones? They can have a worse relaxation associated with them, right? Um, so that's definitely something that, that we could think about. Um, I assume that would be uh, quite a bit more work. Uh, and at least for myself, I don't know how theoretically to go about it. So I think your point of doing this from a sort of data-driven point of view is, is reasonable. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, hi, Ruth. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Hey, yeah, I really, uh, yeah, it's re really great talk. Maybe a naive question is uh, for your partitioning hierarchy, is there any connections with the basic step hierarchy or the, if there is no connection with that? That's a really good question. If there are, we haven't thought through it. That is a really good question. I will have to get back to you on that. Okay, thank you. Just, just okay. curious. Yeah. No, no, that's 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 quite reasonable. Any okay, other uh, question? I, yes, I do. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, uh, Ruth, um, so you're you're part partitioning on the input space. Uh, one thing I was right. wondering is whether you considered partitioning on the states of the neurons. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, so we basically in this is a lot of failed things before stuff worked, right? So mm. um, uh, um, basically, I mean, you know, we, we keep the same partitioning strategy across all of our all of our results. So so hopefully we're we're not cheating. Um, but but and it's working for many different uh, neural nets. Um, but what you can see is that if I choose a bad partitioning strategy, I'm just going to do automatically worse than than big M, right? And so at least the things that we had thought about was we thought about sort of um, maybe, you know, like these are images, right? So we thought, well, maybe some of the, the inputs, things that are close in Euclidean distance are going to somehow they should be aggregated. No, that didn't work. And we tried um, all sorts of other things. Um, and uh, this was the closest this this is this is what worked for us. Um, that's not to say that more ideas, uh, such as you're mentioning, uh, on on the the state of the neuron or something like that, wouldn't be amazing, right? Um, I think there's a there's a lot of possibilities here, and for us, the difficulty became sort of uh, testing, 
uh, what, what would be the, the reasonable things to do and also having a good enough intuition, right? So this was, you know, our closest intuition is what I'm highlighting uh, here, which is that somehow we would like the relaxation to be good for all of the inputs, but that might not be what you want in the end. I'm not sure. Mm. Or rather, I know that it's better than big M. I don't know that it's better than, you know, some other partitioning strategy that would, would be much better, right? I see. I I try to I try to use I try to come up with something like partitioning the input space to count linear regions, but I was never mm. successful doing what you did. So, so that's why I ended up moving in the direction of looking at the states of the neurons because yeah. in SAT, they do things like that. Ah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's a good point because, I mean, um, we should revisit your paper for um, how to, for more ideas for partitioning because, I mean, we're just, you know, we're, we're, we just feel like we're in the dark on this. I mean, we have something that works, right? It works better than, mm -hmm. works significantly better than Big M, but we don't, you know, it's not like, oh, you know, solved. No, I mean, this is a very hard formulation. I mean, I think this is a very convenient problem that everybody's talking about because the formulation is not easy. This brings mm -hmm. all the nightmares from integer programming to life, right? Right, right. But I think, I mean, the important, one of the important things to remember, and I don't think we've fully wrestled with it yet, is sort of, this isn't just black box optimization, right? This really is like, there's, there's, a, there's a form there, right? And the, the neural network is uh, sort of, you know, it's, there's an underlying structure. And I think you deal with that quite well in like your lossless compression paper, for instance. Um, but um, uh, when you're, you know, reducing the, the number of layers and this kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, it's sort of deeper things with sort of recognizing underlying structure is where uh, integer programmers can really get involved, right? And so sort of work like yes. what you've do, done uh, and sort of extending these sort of things is super important. Yeah, very cool work. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Okay. So I think uh, we you had lots of uh, um, people in the audience and lots of questions. So I think it was um, a great presentation. We thank you very much for uh, joining us today. And we also thank the audience for uh, joining us today. And next week, um, we will have uh, Phoebe Bellanos uh, also giving a seminar about um, the interface between machine learning and mathematical optimization. Thank you all, and see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth.